what, what, I have to ask, what game are we talking about? Oh. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. I, I, don't, I don't think I would like to play that game because that would just be one more, like, world that I would also be broke in. You know what I mean? It's like, this world's, this world's enough, you know? It's like, I don't know. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think they're just making those names up, actually. But that's great. That's great. Um, I, do, I, I do need a new game to play because, you know, Pokemon Go is kind of... Yeah, tired for me. I did play a little bit around Halloween because I picked up a couple different things that I hadn't gotten before. But, yeah, I don't know. Let's just talk about this the whole time. I'm, I'm tired. I don't, I, don't, I don't really feel... Okay, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, the design is due this week, correct? Sometime, I think Wednesday. Yeah. All right. Um, and again, uh, do you have any questions or comments or anything about that? Um, one, one, one point I want to make, and I, pro I probably should have made this earlier in the class, but I'll make it now, is that on occasion people will put something in the Dropbox that they have a question about. All right. That's not the best way to ask a question, because I mean, I grade when I have a chance to, but I check my email every day. So, if you have a question about something, is you're better off to uh, email it to me. You know, the Dropbox is meant to be something that you think is completed, that you really don't have any questions about. So, if you have questions about something, email it to me, as opposed to just posting it in the Dropbox. So, I, I've had a couple people. I'm not sure about in this class, but in other classes, like send me their project um, and ask me to review it before they turn it in. And that's fine, um, but the better thing to do would be to email it to me and not to post it in a Dropbox. Anyhow, we're going to talk a little bit about forms and server-side scripting. Um, if you look at many popular websites, and if you think about it from the perspective of what we studied in this course, there might be something that doesn't quite add up to you. So for example, I'm going to go into Google. And I'm going to search for Italian restaurants. I don't know why everything is so food oriented with me. A lot of my examples. Pardon me? I'm just hungry all the time. Right, exactly. Now, a couple observations. First of all, I googled Italian restaurant, all right? Now, at this moment in time, in fact, there used to be a website where you could see like what people are googling at any point in time. And it's, it's probably pretty frightening, but you could go on that site and see like things that people are searching for. Now, I googled Italian restaurant. I could have googled any number of things, just restaurant, um, you know, sp spaghetti restaurant, pasta restaurant, Something along those lines. And Google returned back to me a page. Now, if you think about it, something doesn't connect right with what we've studied so far. Because the kind of web pages we've made so far with HTML are what are called static web pages. Static. 
Now that doesn't mean that if you touch them, you'll get shocked. What does static mean in this context? Yes? It doesn't change unless someone manually changes the code. So in other words, if you were to open up lab one that you did in this class today, all right, it would look exactly like the way that you turned it in, unless you happen to go in and make a change to it between now and then. That's a static page. It means it doesn't change. Now, if we think about Google and searching for things, it doesn't make sense for, to think of these things as static pages. They couldn't possibly be static pages. First of all, does Google have a web page for every possible thing that someone could search about? Probably not. I mean, that doesn't even make sense, right? I mean, does Google, um, you know, does Google have a programmer sitting there waiting for someone to search for something, and when someone searches for something, they real quick type in an HTML page that shows the results. Now, that's kind of absurd, too. So clearly something else is going on here, something that we haven't talked about in this class. Um, these are what are called dynamic web pages. And dynamic pages change depending on some factors. Let's look at what the Google, uh, um, the Google uh, results page changes on. Let's look at a couple of factors that the Google page changes on. First of all, this result page changes based on what I typed in the little box, right? If I type in Italian restaurants, I get one result page. If I type in Indian restaurant, I get a different result page. So the page changes depending on what I type in the text box. If you read between the lines, the page also changes depending on where I'm at, right? Because notice I typed in Indian restaurant, what did I get? I got Cafe uh, Tandoor, which is on Detroit Road, all right, which is in, in what would that be, Westlake, I think? I got Flavors of India, which is in probably Parma or something like that. Uh, I got this restaurant, which is in North Olmsted. So, it's probably pretty unlikely to assume that the three best Indian restaurants in the world are all in the Cleveland, Ohio area, right? So clearly, in addition to tailoring the search results based on what I typed in the text box, it's also tailoring the search, uh, the, the search results based on where I'm physically located. All right? And if we looked at Italian restaurant, we'd notice the same thing. The top choices are Sorrento's, which is just up the street, uh, Olive Garden, which is by the mall, and Angelina's Pizza, which is also not very far from here. So again, something different's going on here, right? Because they couldn't have these pages out there sitting, waiting for you. All right? Static pages are like going into McDonald's and ordering food, right? You go into McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, what do they do? The Big Mac's already sitting there, right? They go and they grab the Big Mac and they hand it to you. That's all the server does in McDonald's. So it takes something that's already created and gives it to you. That's a static web page. Now, think of Subway. Subway, there are so many variations of what you could get. Even if you get the same sandwich, even if you and I get the same sandwich, by the choices of cheese that you get, and if you want it toasted or not, and vegetables you want on it, and, and sauces or whatever that you want to put on it. Our sandwiches could end up very, very, very different. All right? Now, they don't have a bin full of every combination of subs in Subway sitting there waiting. Oh, wait a minute. You wanted the 
sweet onion chicken teriyaki with um, lettuce, spinach, and onions. All right, let me find that bin. Here it is, right? It wouldn't be practical to do that. That's the same thing as Google couldn't possibly have all the HTML pages ready for everything that people search for. So what do they do at Subway? They make it for you on the fly. They have a recipe on their head. They know how to make a chicken teriyaki sweet onion, whatever it's called, sandwich, right? But they get input from you as to what different things that you want on it. And they make it custom for you right there on the fly. Now with dynamic web pages, it's the same thing, all right? Static web pages work like this. And if you have me for any classes other than this, I'll draw this diagram a million times in those classes. And I'll draw it half a million times in this class. But with web pages that are static, you have your client, which is a person accessing the website that connects via the internet to a web server. The client requests a page and the server responds with the page. And what does that response look like? It's an HTML page. It's an HTML file which has HTML, CSS, and maybe other stuff, images, or JavaScript, or other stuff. How does the client request a page? They request a page a couple different ways. You can request a page by typing in the URL. That's requesting a page. You can request a page by clicking a link. You can request a page by entering in data into a form and pressing the submit button. Now in the case of, of static web pages, you have finished HTML pages. Just like McDonald's, they have finished Big Macs in their bins. And if you request one of them, the web server simply goes out and finds the bin, finds that finished HTML page, and delivers it to the client. So that's the kind of pages we've been doing, where the pages are finished, they're static. They will look the same for everyone that requests them. So the web server has a real easy job in that case. The web server simply grabs a page, finds the files, and sends it back to the person that requested it. In the case of dynamic pages, these are static. In the case of dynamic pages, the web server has a script. Another name for a script is a program. All right. Those of you that have taken C Sharp or Java or any programming language, these programs are programs just like the programs you write in your C Sharp class and your Java class and so on. They have all the same kinds of instructions. They can access databases, if statements, loops, anything that you want to. All right. And they can be written in Java, or they can be written in PHP, or ASP.NET, and there's a variety of languages that can be used, just like there are for desktop programming. So it's really no different. It's programming. But what these are are their scripts, or their programs. They're a set of instructions that you can think of as being a recipe to create a web page. All right? And that recipe can involve a lot of different things. It can involve going to a database and pulling information. So for example, Google constantly updates this database of websites. All right? It constantly goes and searches out websites and builds a, web, uh, builds a database of those websites. And when you do a Google search, you access that database and you create a custom HTML page just based on what you search for. All right. So these are a recipe or instructions. And the web server can access a database and create a page custom for your request, just like the, 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 cash, uh, the, the, the person at Subway creates a sandwich custom for your request. So, 
if I Google something, I Google Italian restaurants, there's not a pre pre-written web page sitting out there waiting for me. There are instructions that tell the web server how to access the database and how to create a custom page. Now here's an important concept. When the server responds, whether it's a static or dynamic page, an HTML page is what gets created. It's just like if you go to Subway or McDonald's, when you leave Subway or McDonald's, either way you have a sandwich, right? It's just a matter of was that sandwich prepared in advance and was sitting there waiting for you? Or was it created on the fly based on your instructions and the recipe that the sandwich artist has in their mind for how to make a chicken teriyaki sandwich? So it's important to realize that either way, the client gets back a web page, whether it's static or dynamically generated. Now, what makes a page dynamic? Well, it can be dynamic based on who is accessing the page, information that's entered on the form, or the location of the person. So in other words, in this case, in Google, the fact that I entered in Italian restaurants is why I got a list of Italian restaurants and not some other kind of restaurant. The fact that I'm in Illyria is why I got those specific Italian restaurants. Another example of a dynamic page is if we go to Canvas. This is an example of where the page is going to depend on who is accessing it. How does it know who is accessing it? Well, based on who logs in. So if I log in, all of our pages will sort of look the same. So in other words, if you were to access Canvas, your page would pretty much look the same, except you wouldn't see these classes. You would see the classes that you're enrolled in. You wouldn't see three emails in the inbox. You'd see however, email, however many emails you add in your inbox, and so on. But the rest of the page would look the same. You'd still have this link. You'd have your account information, your dashboard, and so on. It's just the case of the specific information that got filled in would be different. So this is another case of a dynamic page. It's not like there's an HTML page out there for each of us. This page gets generated on the fly. Another good example of that would be Amazon. If we go to Amazon, they literally have millions of products. So it would be kind of absurd to think that they have millions of HTML pages. That would be overwhelming to create all those web pages. But what they have is sort of a template that gets filled in with the specific information based on what you're looking for. So if you notice, all their pages sort of look the same. There's going to be a picture of the product here, there's going to be the title, the reviews, and so on. If I go and look at another book, it fits the same sort of template. It's just that the specific data is different. All right, so what does that have to do with this class? This class is not a class in server-side scripting. So unfortunately, we are not going to learn this piece of it in this class. We are not going to learn how to create server-side scripts. All right, that's a whole course in itself. And there's two courses, well, there's at least two courses that we talk about that here uh, in, in our web development uh, program. There's CISS 232, where we study PHP, and there's CISS 243, where we use ASP.NET. All right, where again, we don't create uh, static web pages, but we create dynamic web pages. What piece do we talk about in this class? Because we do talk about one piece of this puzzle in this class. We talk about the HTML forms. All right? The HTML form is a way that the user can give some information 
to the web server in that describes what the user is looking for or who the user is or something like that. All right. So we're going to study creating forms. All right. How you create a form, how the form talks to the server side script. That's what we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about actually writing the server side script. Because we're not talking about actually writing the server side script, we have to borrow someone else's server side script. All right? And I am going to borrow Google server side script. Now it's okay to do this. It's not like I'm pulling a fast one over them. They, they you know, they allow you to do this. But if I Google something, All right. This is actually the name of the server-side script. Actually, I'm not going to use Google. I stand corrected. I'm going to use Bing. And the reason is, is because it is actually easier to do this example using Bing. It's not that I prefer Bing to Google. All right. Um, this essentially is the name. This right here is the name of the server-side script that's being called. So we're going to borrow that server-side script. All right. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to create my own form that submits to the Bing's search engine and gets the results. So instead of using the Bing form, I'm going to create my own form that uses their script. So let's go in and I will create my web page. You get to watch me type for the next 20 minutes because I'm the world's worst typist. Now remember, this is unfortunately a case where do as I say, not as I do. A lot of times in the interest of times, I'll make my web page very bare-boned. Again, it's your job to create completed looking web pages so by all means take the time to add CSS and, and all that to it. We'll eventually go and add CSS to it but we will um, um, we will not do that uh, in our first attempt with this. All right. We're going we're gonna to look we're going to start out looking at um, a couple tags with the form. The first thing that we're going to look at is the form tag itself. And I'm putting these quotes in. We'll fill those in in a second. Think, as a, think of a form tag as an envelope of all the stuff, of all the information that you want to send to the server from your form. Now, in the case of the Bing search, there's only one thing we're sending, really, right? We're sending the term that we're searching for. So there's only one thing in the envelope. When we log in the Canvas, there were two things in our envelope, right? There was a user ID and password. If we go to Google's advanced search,
There's a bunch of things in the envelope that we're sending. What words we want, this exact phrase, any of these words, none of these words. Numbers ranging from, and then we can pick language and, and region and so on. So, it's possible to have two forms on one page. So you might sometimes have two form tags on a page. That would be if you had a log on screen and a add user account screen on the same screen. A lot of times though you're only going to have one form on the page because all the information that you want to send, you want to send all in one neat tidy package together to the server. Now in this case again, all we really want to do is send one word, our search term. All right. The method is either the word get or the word post. We'll talk more about that later on, but right now we're going to use get. This simply sort of describes how the data is going to be sent. Get means that the data is going to be passed on the query string. What is the query string? The query string is actually part of the URL. In fact, if we look at this, our Bing search, the query, th query string is everything after the question mark. Question, query, you know, sort of, um, you know, simil very similar words. So, in other words, in this example, they've used the query string because that's why it says Q equals something. And it's after the question mark. So the question mark indicates the query string. And then we have pairs of the names of the variable that we're sending and the value of the variable. In this case, Q equals Italian restaurant means that the Bing search engine is expecting the term that we're searching for to be called Q. So I need to match that up if I'm going to borrow their script. I have to give the script what it is expecting. for, uh, what it is expecting. And it's expecting the word that you are searching for to be called Q. And it's expecting it on the query string. All right? Now, because it's expecting it on the query string, I use get here as the method. The other option is post. With post, you don't actually see the values on the query string. It's sent some other way. That might be useful, for example, if you're sending a password. If you're sending a password, you don't necessarily want the password to show up on the query string. So you would use post then. All right. Now, what is the action? The action is the name of the server-side script that you want to call. Now, in this case, the name of the server-side script is everything before the question mark. So I'm going to copy that and put that in the action of my form. HTTP colon slash slash bing dot com slash search. That is the name of the script on the Bing web server that does web searches. How does it know what you are searching for? It will find that in the query string. What gets put on the query string? All the different elements that are on our form. And we'll create those elements in a second here. All right. Now again, because this is on a different web server, it's not, on, it's not one of our programs, we have to put HTTP in at the beginning of it. Okay. So every form is going to have an action and a method. If the method part is fuzzy for you right now, just always use get. All right. This needs to be the name of the script that's going to be called. And either someone's going to give that name to you, or you're going to be the person that creates that code, and therefore you'll know what name you're going to create it under. So now I have to go and I have to create my actual form itself. And generally speaking, a form 
you can think of as being an unordered list of fields. Now you might say, I don't want bulleted bullet points and all that. That's fine. We'll get rid of those. Right? Remember, we, will, um, we, we can make it look any way that we want to. So don't think, well, I don't want it to look that way. That's really what a form is. is it's an unordered list. And in this case, it's pretty simple because we only have one field. But really, if you have more than one form field, you could probably enter them in, in any order. There's no particular reason that they have to be ordered in, ordered, uh, entered in a certain order. All right. The tag for many of the kinds of form fields that we're going to use is the input tag. All right. There are other tags for form elements, but we're going to use, for many of these, we're going to use the input tag. Type equals text. All right. That tells us that that's a text box. Think of a text box as being a single line of text. Now, you can have other things out of form as well, right? You can have radio buttons, you can have check boxes, you can have drop down lists, you can have multi line text, where you have multiple lines of text, like comments or description or something like that. All right? But a single line of text is a text box. So you say input type equals text. All right? Name equals Q. Now, is that a coincidence that I picked Q as the name? Absolutely not. Why did I pick Q as a name? Because the script, if I look at, if I sort of reverse engineer this and look at when I do a Bing search, what it calls the different things on the query string, Remember the query string being after the question mark. The word that I'm searching for, the word or phrase that I'm searching for, on the query string is called Q. All right? Things on the query string, again, there's the name of the value that I'm sending, and then there's the actual value itself. So the name of the value is Q. The actual value, in this case, is Italian restaurant. So you'll see on the query string, name equals value. You then, if there's more than one field, there'll be an ampersand, and then the next field, QS equals LS. I'm not sure, frankly, what that means. I could probably investigate and find that out, but I'm not going to bother in this case. All right? Because I'm really only interested in this one. So, I pick Q for the reason. Now, either Someone's going to tell you this, or you're the person that's writing the code, and therefore you're going to know. Well, when I wrote the server-side script that does this search, I used the variable or the, the name Q to represent the thing I was searching for. All right, there you go. I'm going to end my LI. Last but not least, I'm going to have the button that says go and actually do the search. This is actually a button that says go and do that search. That's also an input tag, but it's not a text box. It's a submit button. Submit means what? It means send to the server. That I've entered in all the data, I now want to go and actually execute the search or execute whatever the server-side script is. It might be to log in. 
right? In Canvas, we saw that. The button, what the button did is it went and logged in, all right? And again, if I logged in correctly, it would show me my page. If I logged in incorrectly, it would show me a message saying your user ID and password are wrong, all right? In this case, what it's going to do is it's going to give me my search results. So let's go and run this and see what happens. Let's go and save this. Put it on the desktop. This is an HTML file. which is somewhere on here. Yeah, there we go. And for good measure, I'll call it form. All right. So now we open this up. There's our fields. That form looks ugly, right? But we can, we can fix it, right? Remember, if we're talking about the way it looks, that's a question of CSS. So we can fix this and make it look better via CSS. Right now, I just want to make sure we have the HTML piece of it down, the functionality, and then we'll worry later on about the appearance. There's also accessibility issues with forms. All right, we, we last week we talked a lot about accessibility of websites and forms provide their own challenges to people that are accessing it on a screen reader and we'll talk about how that is addressed. So anyhow, I can type in Italian restaurants and click my search button and there we go. It called the script on Bing's web server, did the search for Italian restaurant, and shows me my results. Now again, normally when we do this, we've written both pieces of it. So we're submitting to our own server-side script. But, because we're not learning server-side scripting in this class, we have to sort of borrow and do a little bit of reverse engineering to make sure we know what things are named. All right? Questions about this? Let's hit the highlights. Form tag goes around everything that we want to send to the server. Very often you will have one form tag per page. There are exceptions to this. But think of the form tag as being the envelope of everything that you want to send to the server as part of your request. In this case, what do we want to send? The only thing we really want to send is the word that we're searching for, the phrase that we're searching for. The action is the name of the script that we're sending it to. So either someone will give that to you or you will know it because you've written both sides, both the client side, both, both the form in HTML and the server side script. And the method simply deals with how the data is being sent. Just for laughs, let me change this to post and see what we get. One of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to work or it's not going to work. All right? It depends what Bing is expecting. Maybe Bing doesn't care how you send it. Or maybe Bing requires you to use the query string. We'll only know when we find out. Ah, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, Bing requires you to use the query string. Notice we don't see anything on there about Q equals Italian restaurant, right? Because we didn't send it on the query string. So, we learned from this that Bing requires us to send it via the query string. 
it's possible to write the server-side script where you don't care if it goes on the query string or if it goes invisible, not on the query string. But apparently when they created this, they do care, and it has to be on the query string. We're then going to have these different form elements. And these different form elements correspond to the piece of information that we're sending to the server. And in this case, we really only have one thing that we want to send to the server. We want to send the search phrase. The search phrase we know because we've looked at the, the, the name of the server-side script requires a value to be called Q. Therefore, we give a name of Q. It's a text box. So we say type equals text. And that's on an input tag. The submit button is what sets the ball in motion. It's what takes the values that we've entered to the form, calls the server-side script, and gives that server-side script those values. In this case, it puts them on the query string so they can be pulled up. So that's the very basics of a form. All right. Now there's four more topics that we're going to talk about concerning forms. And we'll start those today and we'll wrap those up next time. The four topics are other form controls. Appearance of forms. Accessibility for forms. And finally, HTML5 form controls. All right, so we talked about a text box. Text box is for a single line of text. We talk, uh, what are some other kinds of form controls that you can have? What are other ways that you can ask the user for input that's not a text box, that's not a single line of text? I don't remember. What are other ways that you can ask the, uh, people for input other than a, a text box? Radio button. Radio button. A drop down. All right. Boxes. Pardon me? Check boxes. Check boxes. Um, let, let's jot these down and we'll talk about them and we'll talk about when to use each of these. Radio buttons. Check boxes. Um, Someone said drop downs, right? Um, text areas. Text areas like a text box, except it's multiple lines. Um, yeah, exactly. Password field. These are the basic ones that were in HTML4. All right. A couple of these are obvious when you use them, right? A text area you're going to use when you have more than one line of text. So if you ask someone to um, enter in a description of the problem that they've experienced, you know, maybe it's a, a problem form or a complaint form. All right. A text box would only allow them to type one line of data. But you might want them to allow, allow them to type in multiple lines of data. So that's going to be a text area. A password control is going to be used when you're entering in a password, obviously. Um, what about these things? What's the difference between a radio button and a checkbox? Yes. Yeah, radio buttons are grouped together. And you can only pick one from a group. So if you had, for example, whoops, what is your major? C 
CISS, accounting, biology, and you might have a list of things. If you used a radio button, if you picked one, you could not pick the other ones. As soon as I picked a different one, it would unselect that one. It's like the radio button in a car. You can only listen to one station at a time. If you pick a new station, it gets rid of the old station. A checkbox might be, if the question was phrased a little bit differently, what is something that you're interested in majoring in? And then you might have CISS, accounting, bio, and so on. With a radio, uh, I'm sorry, with a checkbox, you could select more than one thing at, at the same time. Think of a checkbox as being a series of yes or no questions. And you can answer, and that work independently of each other. So you can answer yes or no to each of them. All right? What's the difference between a drop down and radio buttons? Drop down list has values you can add to it. You can also do the same thing with radio buttons. You can. Okay, um, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, I, th I have a feeling you're thinking of C sharp more so than HTML. And HTML radio buttons actually can have values too. All right, so so that that would be a different, you know, um, that that would be a difference. But you can also have have that in there. Um, really, the only difference is is whether you see all of them or not. When a drop down, you don't see all of them until you click on it. With a radio button, they're all there and they're all displayed all the time. So maybe if you have a whole bunch of selections, you would use a drop down. That way it would take up less space on the screen. Whereas if you only had three or four selections, you might use a radio button. All right. Why would you use either of these instead of just having text boxes? Why not have text boxes for everything? Major and have a blank field that they could type anything they want to in. Right. Right, exactly. In other words, where there is a limit to what is allowable. All right? So there are only a certain number of things you can major, on, uh, major in at a college. Right? You can't come in and say, I am majoring in Pokemon Go. So I'm going to type that in. All right? There's only a certain number of things you can major in. And what's more, when there are a certain number of things that you can uh, major in, you want that to be consistent. Right? So for example, CISS. Someone could type in, if, if you had just a plain text box, you could just, someone could type in CISS. Someone could type in CIS. Someone could type in Comp Infosys. Someone could type in Computer Information Systems. So there could be variance in if there was a text box. If there is a drop down or radio buttons or even check boxes, you can limit the choices. And you can say, all right, here are your choices. So you're not going to get the variations. Keep in mind that oftentimes these forms are connected to databases. And there might be requirements on the database that only certain values are allowed. And therefore, you want to make sure that the user provides those values when they enter the form in. All right. So next time we'll look at how to actually code these other form controls. Some of them will use the input tag. Some of them will use other tags. We'll see that next time, as well as addressing the appearance of, of these forms, uh, accessibility issues, and uh, then finally some specific HTML5 controls. All right. We'll see you up in lab.